It's time for this morning in Psalm 1. Happy are those who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor linger in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seats of the scornful. They are like trees planted by a stream of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do will not, everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like child which are made close of me. Therefore the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sin in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be. Just live. 
idolatry, witchcraft, wrath, strife, murders, drunkenness, envy, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lavishousness, just living loosely. But a life in the spirit, on the other hand, is a life that is funny enough harder than a life in the flesh. It is easy to live a life in the flesh. But a life in the spirit is a more disciplined life, a life that requires certain spiritual disciplines of us. The first thing he says about a life in the spirit is that if you be led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So a life in the spirit is a life free from the law. And we are talking about all these laws that we even find in the Old Testament that was very burdensome upon the people, all 900 and all of them. And Paul is saying if you are people of the Spirit that live by the Spirit, then you cannot be under the law because Christ has set you free. I wonder where that leaves those who insist to this day that they are going to be keeping those laws to the teeth. I wonder what kind of life we can see such persons are living. Because Paul makes it very clear that if we are, we are led by the Spirit, if we are living under the Spirit, we cannot be under the law. And as I said, the law we're talking about is the Old Testament law, the Old Covenant. We are now under the New Covenant. And because we are under the New Covenant, then we are people who are living by the Spirit. He also says that those who live by the Spirit begin to manifest the Spirit in their lives. Those who live by the Spirit begin to manifest the Spirit in their lives. For some, they will say manifesting the Spirit means to speak in tongues. Some will say that if you really have the Spirit, you will jump up and down and shout and roll on the ground. But some will say to have the Spirit, it means that you are so holy and heavenly minded that you have no earthly use. But Paul says something different. He says that to really be living a life in the Spirit is to bear the fruit of the Spirit. To bear the fruit of the Spirit. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such, there is no law. That is what the life of the Spirit looks like. So that we may speak in the tongues of a million angels and mortals. As the same Paul says in Corinthians, but if we have not we are not bearing the fruit of the Spirit, then we cannot say we are truly living a life in the Spirit. So when somebody asks you, are you in the Spirit? Or have you ever been in the Spirit? We can say yes. That's if we have been bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Because there are many who will speak in the tongues and do all of those outward actions that have not yet started to know and understand what it means to be to have long suffering. There are many who manifest the outward signs but still have no gentleness about them. There are many who manifest the signs and have no faith. There are still many who are manifesting the outward signs and saying, I am in the Spirit. But they have no peace and they have no joy within their hearts. So, this is a very good passage, my friends. Yes. For us to take with us. For us to, because here in this little passage that we have here, we are able to refute immediately two claims that are made by
by our, some of our Christian brothers and sisters. As I said, the first thing is that if you are going to be living by the Spirit, you cannot be under the law. And second claim is that to be in the Spirit does not mean and does not only manifest it in outward actions and in speaking of words, but most importantly and primarily, it is living a life of joy, peace, gentleness, temperance, goodness, long-suffering, and faith. Yes, Mr. Chancellor. I have no idea because there are many who I guess you know the talk so and I don't know that it is the interpreting and remember that Paul says in Corinthians that who is it edifying if you can't interpret it? But we have to understand when we go back to the whole matter of tongues that when they speak about tongues in scripture. We go back to Acts of the Apostles and the Day of Pentecost. These tongues were identifiable languages. So that is why when these disciples started to speak in these different tongues, the people who were there saying, Are all these not Galileans? How comes you're hearing some of them talking in Parthians and some talking in the, the language of the Medes and some talking in the language of the Mesopotamians and some talking in the language of the Egyptians? Who did they do? Do they know all these languages? So they were identifiable languages. And why were these languages given to them? Tongues and languages are the same thing, you know? Yes. Why were these languages or these tongues given to them? Because they needed to spread the gospel to other parts of the world. Amen. And how else were they going to be able to spread the gospel mm -hmm. to the other parts of the world? If it is that they didn't know the language, the local language of the people that they were going to um, evangelize to. So that was why the tongues were given, so that they could evangelize to people who had never heard the gospel. And these were identifiable languages. Now, when in our church context, in this day and age, we may hear someone speaking in the tongues, the question then is, who is it edifying to? Hmm. Who is benefiting from it? Because the purpose we get language is to proclaim the gospel. Mm -hmm. And if we are proclaiming the gospel in a language that somebody cannot understand, what sense really does it make? And this is the point that Paul makes in Corinthians. This is the very point that he makes, that really and truly, if nobody is being edified, nobody can understand, then it really makes no sense at all. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a friend who is, she's a um, minister in the Church of God of Prophecy. And she said to me that, you know, she speaks in tongues. And she has read for herself in the scripture. The same thing that I'm saying even now. That really and truly is edifying in no one. So she says she finds that when she's speaking in tongues these days, nobody hears it. It's her language to God. She's speaking only to God. She does, nobody's hearing her at all. Because really and truly nobody is being edified. And sometimes you go to some churches, I'm not bashing anybody's church, but it gets out of control. It really gets out of control and everybody says oh, you don't know what is being said and how do you as a person going to be edified by the word of god at the end of the day how are you blessed by that and what change and effect does that have on you if i come here and i start to speak in amharic the language of the ethiopians and I preach in Amharic, and I have a prayer book in Amharic, and I do the whole service in Amharic. What do you leave with? Nothing. What do you leave with? 
happy or babbling. So what I'm saying, what do you indeed leave with? So, indeed, that is why Paul says, Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am nothing more than a loud flesh clanging cymbal. And as you say in our culture, an empty barrel. <laughs> you are nothing more than that. He says, when we speak in tongues and have not love, which, pre which precedes and supersedes all the tongues that we may speak. So, that's a good point that you brought up. Because it's many times a misunderstood topic, a misunderstood subject. And it's something that we need to be armed with as Anglicans. Yes. So that they can't tell us that because you don't speak in tongues, mm. you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. As we see right here in Gal Galatians chapter 5, to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be manifested with the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, faith, long-suffering. That is what the fruit of the Spirit and being in the Spirit is all about. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray for the church and for the world. We'll use the general intercession on page 75. Pray, Lord, that your spirit 
will be upon you. We pray especially for the family of Noel Road. Pray, Lord, that you will grant them your holy comfort and peace. Lord, in your mercy, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us therefore confess our sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and one another in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The kingdom of God is justice, peace, and joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 